control decks are hard to play. And it comes down to us needing to deal with as many enemy threats as possible and to deny value. And we don't have a lot of points for ourselves. So when we do remove things on their side of the board, we have to make sure they count for more than what our cards are worth. For example, if an offering does four damage, we better have that payoff at least six or eight. So we're getting positive returns. And it's all about optimizing what we do so that we could take away from what they're looking to do. And it's a big brain deck, okay? If you need a math refresher, it ties in perfectly with today's sponsor, Brilliant. Whether you're looking to advance in your career or simply become better at competitive card games, let me tell you about a free and easy way to get started. Brilliant.org is the best way to learn math, science, and computer science interactively. Whatever your skill level, Brilliant customizes content to fit your needs with its thousands of hands-on lessons ranging from basic to advanced topics. To top it all off, new content is added monthly so you can continue challenging yourself. What I love about Brilliant is that I'm able to solve problems at my own pace and the interactive experience makes learning fun instead of feeling like a chore. In the intro to simulation course I'm taking, you can learn how to make more accurate estimates when it comes to everyday things like how long should my new gaming PC last? To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Qcento or click the link in the description. The first 200 of you will also get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. I'm sure you'll love it. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Now let's get into the deck list here. What I like to do in a round one is open up with Venadane. With this one here, he moves up to two cards from our hand to the bottom of our deck, adds a waylay to the hand for each card moved that way, and whenever we play a waylay, spawn an Elven Deadeye in this row. So this card here turns waylays into an extra three points by getting another body on the board, and helps with consistency because we could put bricks that we have in our hand at the bottom of our deck. Now, with the leader, we actually have the Sentinels, and with the two in deck plus the two waylays in our deck, we have a potential four bricks we could be pulling into in round one. To be able to put two of those at the bottom of the deck from the beginning is very useful, and it plays into our strategy of trying to be responsive as well, because if we need a proactive turn, let's say we're going first, we could put this card down, but then everything they try to respond with now we have the waylays that are going to help us chip those things down or remove them, and we can use leader pings accordingly as well. Let's say we want to get rid of a four power engine, we can just one leader ping, use a waylay for example. So I really like opening up the round with those for that reason there. If we find that they're playing into the round a little bit beyond just the Venadane waylay turns, or if they deal with this on demand, then we can sort of pivot our strategy into maybe the Dwarven Chariots with the Dwarf Berserkers. So putting this down on melee will make it seven power with three armor, which is what I'll do against a heavy control matchup like Skellige Warriors. And if we don't have to worry as much about that, we can always just put this on the range row and this will go ahead and spawn two Rowdy Dwarfs with one armor each. So it's playing for the same amount of points. It's just about how we're splitting up the points that makes the difference with that in how we play it so we have that down we play around with the dwarf berserkers so with these if they have barricade meaning if they have armor at the end of your turn damage self by one and remove or sorry and damage random enemy by one as well so it's essentially just a one point per turn engine we're losing armor we're dishing random damage and we can pad this up at the end of our turn every turn so that these never expire so if you can get both of these out there with one of the chariots all the better i don't like using two chariots in one round because i do have the other strategy being the zoldan and this is just like a really good swing in whether it be a bleed round two or just a short round three if we just want to get points on the board so that's kind of why i like to split up the chariots with the zoldans and yeah, it's just uh, that's sort of what we'll live by with that whole strategy there. This one's really cool. Damage two units by three, and then for each that survived, spawn a Rowdy Dwarf. So we can break things down, complete kills with leader if we need to, and we get those extra bodies on the board. 
a lot of this chariot stuff and the waylay stuff is spawning. We're going fairly wide with this, which is why I actually have Sarah Quan in the deck. And I find it fits perfectly because if we have a chariot and a Zoltan round, we have a really good Quan. If we have a Venadane round one, we still have a very good Quan. If we have a short round three with Simlas, with the volleys of waylays, we still have, again, a very good Quan. So it's very difficult for this card to brick, especially with the leader bringing out a created Sentinel and then the two from deck. There's just always going to be bodies on the board. This deck doesn't go tall at all. It goes very wide. So to have something that's like a wide payoff makes a lot of sense in a case like this. Okay. So perfect case scenario, you can get like almost 20 damage off this guy if you really wanted to. But we never really sit that long. If we're getting 8 or 9 damage, that's taking out something very important. It's almost like having a tall punish for 8 provisions. So that's why we have it there. After we would have spent the waylays, we have the two initial ones in deck. We've created two more here, and we're playing those two in the same round. We could take Alyssa and put back the two that we spent in round one off the Venadane in the deck so that we have a total of four waylays that we're bringing out later with Simlas. And that's sort of like our finisher move if we go into a short round three, and this is one of our three cards, and we don't pull into anything else that's going to brick that, like a one of the waylays, then we have pretty much one of the best combos in the game at our disposal. So I like that for that reason. Very hard to beat. We're holding our points to the very end. It still packs a punch. And, you know, that's definitely a way to look at it. If we don't have the opportunity to put the waylays back, or there might be a situation where we'd rather go for a tall punish, then I can put Alyssa with the Curse of Corruption, and we could just go for that tall punish or even the Heat Wave. So there are other options. Sometimes, too, we play a couple waylays, we get Graveyard Punish against us, whether it be Xavier or Squirrel. You know, this is an alternative strategy that we can go about, right? And oftentimes, in the 9P slot, I would have had maybe Hengate Sword or something else. I'm finding that Royal Decree is really nice because this deck all comes down to can I pull things that I want when I want to? And if I'm able to get, whether it be the Zoltan, the Simlas, the Venadane, the Alyssa, or the Quan, when we want, then it's very tough to stop what we're doing. And that's why I have the double tutor as it is. And... Beyond that, I think skirmishers are just really nice. Using these in conjunction with the waylay or leader or chipping things down for offering just makes a lot of sense. A lock feels pretty good here. If you didn't want to use a lock, Xavier would be a, a good bet as well. And you can go for like the graveyard punish route. Or you could just maybe remove one of the skirms and put in a squirrel if you want a graveyard punish. I don't think that it's absolutely necessary. The pellers here, because I have a lot of engines right? So at least four of them that we're looking at that are important. And worst case scenario, we use it offensively. We get through a defender, so we don't have to spend maybe a heat wave on a defender. We can put it towards what's going behind that defender. So I like the way that this feels. Feels optimized to me. I had a lot of fun playing it. and Definitely give it a try if you guys are looking for like a hyper control list to play. And that's pretty much it. I have four games of live commentary for reference. And if you guys enjoy the content that you see, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and I will see you very soon. Okay, first up here we have Patricidal Fury, Skellige. And we go first. I don't love the idea of going first because they play very responsive and so do we. But we definitely have enough points to get out of the round. So I'm not too concerned about that. Realistically, Peller, maybe not. I don't think they're going to go in for the Sove in round one. That would be very aggressive. That would be pretty much the only thing I'd want to purify would be if they do the infusion on a Savage Bear or something like that on our side. To start off here with seven points on the board and an engine that's going to help us play defensively, is ideal. Just want to start that one off as well. Berserkers are great. 
It just requires so much effort for them to remove these. So we have bleeding on that. So basically, they're getting one point per turn. Now we're netting one point per turn. They hit us with the double. We're just trading four provisions here. Kind of makes you wish you had the Peller after all, but we can go ahead for the Sappers here. Just get rid of the three bleeding that place for seven points. The Berserker on the left is getting into removal range, but we don't really need it here. So we get out of round one without having to spend too much, which is great. Again, we did it off the bronze end. We saved a lot. It's a very difficult matchup to push into because they get a lot of value through the resurrections into round two and round three. And it makes it difficult for me to bleed because I don't have a lot of proactivity. So to go ahead and take Venadane and see where that goes, it's not a bad start. Really depends on how they respond to it if we were to play in a bit more, because in this matchup, it's very difficult for us to not lose card, because they'll just spend leader and sove, and that's a lot of points. Luckily, we have Curse Corruption here, so. Yeah, let's just take the other one. If they're gonna let me have the Venadane spawn value, I'm gonna take it. And the more we set up the board, the better it gets for the Seraquan, so. It's looking pretty good. I think we can just aggro push this, use leader. Notice how we're not killing the invaders because we don't want them to be able to come back off like a war clans or whatever the case. It would be a lot of value for them. 30 to 2. Basically, we're demanding an answer here. What do you got? I want to see some of what you got. Because if they do take that leader so that's what we want. We have an answer to that right away. Fakusha is really bad in round 3 for us as well if they have tear down. I feel like we just push this as long as we can go. Could lock it, could just kill it. I don't think I'm going to have a board state to make that count in round three unless we take the waylay swing and then play this. It's likely just better to play it here. You're going to laugh, but I actually think that we take the offering. I feel like every point counts, and I haven't seen enough yet. Really slow, one-point turn. Hate to say, but they can get out with their leader solve anyways, which is why we have to see it one way or another. I can answer it. Okay, we can lock that. If they play tier, we could answer tier with curse. Nothing. Yeah, unfortunately I don't think that's worth playing into anymore. They know what we're trying to do, I think, so this is what makes it that much more difficult. No way. The fact that I actually got two cards out of them there, they didn't get to overkill because the round one was so short and we had so much armor that Bran comes down for seven points for the tie. That was like 
the best possible outcome we can get there for a trade. We got two waylays in hand. As long as I don't brick these, I'm doing pretty well. Believe in the heart of the cards, we get it going. Now we just have card advantage in round three. So, I think Curse Corruption is better to be spent on whatever they resurrected. So, we take Simlas here and get rid of that. We do waste one of the waylays though, but the trade-off is just better. So Harold, okay. It's Harold, then the point slam, which is going to be the great sword in this case. As long as the Harold ping doesn't hit the armor, we're doing all right. But as it looks like right now, we have enough points on board. Yeah, so we just take that. Don't even have to play the Peller. For the second game, same matchup. They did it once. Let's see if we can do it again. The opening hand's not bad. And we're on red coin, which actually makes it feel even better. I like the idea of just being able to float the siege and then just, yeah. I like the non-interactive approach here. I'm hoping that they have a handful of raid cards they can't play. And it gets like a weird discard type situation going on. But we can't really keep that up for too long. I feel like this plays really well into their matchup. At least early game, the armor makes the world of a difference when the raid cards aren't worth as much. Does pretty well against uh, Nilfgaard as well, soldiers. Just avoiding all the random pings. So their idea is to clash that out, I guess. Yeah, you see, then we take the bleeding, they try to clash off the seven. Okay. Pretty good elite setup here. They could still do it off the invader, but is it even worth it? What's frustrating for us is that I'm trying to push so that we're winning on even, and the bleeding makes that very difficult. Might as well run it back with this. I'm getting, I would say, pretty low rolls, but at least that gives us a bit of a buffer. We get ahead. And I'm not keeping anything high base power, so if they try to clash, well, best of luck. You're taking out two or three power. Hakusha coming down in round one at this stage of the round is very good. It tells me that they have to hold on to some of what they got. I 
I'm just thinking what would be the best way to trade here. Especially with all that damage we're going to be taking. Maybe just take the big dwarf swing. Zoltan goes on melee. We just play for direct points. But then we get those armor pockets here. We could try to eat up some of that. And it might help us keep the chariot alive too. So coming down, okay, this is exactly what we want. So they're going to basically battle it out with the Clash. I haven't seen that one before. I think that's pretty smart. Unfortunately, though, we just go and answer that right away. Easy. There's a lot of provisions to put into a strategy that's not working. Right, we had Soul out of the way. We had the location. Then we had Fukusha. Now we can play this comfortably and at our own pace. We'll put the waylay at the bottom of the deck. That's not a problem. The Skoyatel must the woods abandon. Join us instead and defend the valley. I have a feeling like I want to keep the lock. It pays off immediately, that's funny. Yeah, so if I could take away some value from that for the War Clans for later, or the tier, or whatever. Let's do it. I don't expect to win in two, but we have to play it down. And if we can get Vanadane out there just for a couple more turns, the waylay value is going to be really good. They could have maybe just killed the Venadane. Because they would have got 4 plus the 3 immediately instead of the 8. Easy heat wave there. Again, we just got to keep pushing in here. In a perfect situation, I'd be playing Alyssa and then passing, just going all in. And that's what I got to see. We have to get rid of leader. There's so many different things we got to get rid of here. A bloody goal. For the people of heart. That's a big turn. It's not enough though. Because if I play Alyssa, Alyssa coming down at six points puts me up by three. And I don't like doing this, but usually in matchups where I feel like I need to, we'll just uh we'll roll the dice in round three because I get Onero back in hand, which is less likely to clog up my hand with everything else. So 
So Champion's Charge does it by one. I'm glad they played the brand already. I feel like they were definitely overkilling some tokens and stuff. Okay, so I don't have any bricks. But I don't think offering is very good. However, we got lucky enough, I don't really want to ruin it, so it's probably just going to have to stay that way. So we're playing the discard game, so Savagery. As much as I would want to just float the Skirm, it doesn't actually give us any points because I can't use the order. We need Barricade for that, so we have to discard the other one. And last card's Bloody Goal, so if I play the Dwarf, they kill it. And if I don't, they still get the points, so really it doesn't matter what we do here. They get six. They give us one. Or two, rather. So 19 to two. We gotta split the difference. I mean, Sim last place for like 25 points, so. not ignorant. Remember to whom you speak. Time for you to die. And coming up here next, got Nilfgaard, Tactical Decision. You never know what you're up against when you play against this one. This hand's really good, because I could take Venadane, put back the sentries at the bottom, or sentinels at the bottom, and then uh, we're pretty much good. That's literally one of the things I love about Venadane the most and why he works so well in a deck like this because you can put things back to the bottom. So many cards you just don't want to pull into. Yeah, okay. Definitely not going to let that stick. Right, they play Joust, they play just pretty much anything. They're getting three points per card they play of value. I'm not about to let that one go. As far as what we're going to be boosting in deck, normally it's going to be the Sentinels. Because they're in hand, then it has to be a card that we know we're going to play. In this case, Simlas. Now we're running into Mill, and that's terrifying. So... If they get rid of the Simlas, there's a big chance we might not be able to win the game. A lot of times I take teleportation on the Kingslayer, so we'll just be proactive here and try to get rid of that. So Cal V, Leader Panic. Okay. That's a lot for just 24 points. When I see someone trying to get out of the round this badly, it tells me to keep them in even more. I wasn't going to push it so hard, but when you see it... Especially when we're just trading leaders like that, and we like trading leader. Yeah, they're just hitting like every good card. Sure. At least they don't have armor on that, that's good. 
this would be the pass. That's greed. I shall be your eyes, my lord. It's a little late for that lock, but I like how they're three for three on the gold cards already. I'm thinking, in case they have Ring of Favor, we get this board swarmed as much as possible and just get ready to, like, sort of counter that with the Seraquan. So they have a one point per turn engine, kind of. So do we. I say kinda, because it's contingent on what we play, right? It has a cooldown of two. Or what they play, rather. So Torres is easy. 21 point Torres gets cursed. I think that's probably the best we're going to get. If they play the ring, then we can't win the round. It's unlikely, but this is a good start. Okay, first round's done. Simlas in hand, so we don't have to worry about the Vilgaforts anymore. That was probably the biggest concern I had. That's a good hand. That's even better. Playing on melee to basically play around the coup a little bit and not take damage if they were to take coup on it. I guess we just do that. So the discard was the teleportation makes sense. That's not a card you want to have in your hand when you're trying to defend the bleed. Okay. So yeah, we play that the way I wanted to play that. Obviously, now we just got to take some of this armor off. I think we just go for the points here. Go for the points, go for the bodies here. They played the coup, so that's out of the way. And Quan would have been six points of damage with all this armor coming down. We know it's likely going to be Kogram. What I've seen so many times, they basically try and mill us down and play Kogram because of that. Instead of clogging, you can do it one of two ways. I kind of want to see it. So if they're going to play it, it's going to be now. We still have a healthy lead otherwise. I demand justice. A trial by the thing is, if I were to pass there, I'd have the card advantage, but they might not have played it. It really comes down to what's in the hand, you know? If something else could have done it, then... If it was left, though, we'd be better off just passing, but... Yeah. 
So the deck's just as good as it's gonna be, really. That's everything we need. It's probably this. Just because if they coo it, there's nothing for them to hit. It's also damage on demand if we need to really. Yeah, we take those. Unfortunately, I can't use the order on that, but. It's looking uh, pretty good for us. Unless they can renew the Colgrim, that's a problem too. A Simlas would take it down though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's Letho. Fair enough, that wasn't very close. And for the last game, we have Royal Inspiration, Northern Realms. It's been a while since I've played against Northern Realms that wasn't just shuffling. So, shuffling or siege are the big two that I've been seeing. Knights, not as much. I feel like the Knights deck is pretty consistent and it hasn't really changed much over the last year or so. So we sort of just play into it like the running scenario, Erendite, Heat Wave, Shield Package. I'm conflicted here because if they have like a Margarita or Marguerite, then they're locking that. If they have a heat wave, they're heat waving it. There you go. I just don't want to have to use the Onero for a Peller. But either way, it kind of hurts. I could turn that engine off and then soak up the damage with that. That's nice. So we definitely have to shut that down. It's worth a leader ping here for sure. So we can't curse it. We kind of have to play this. It would have been that or just taking the Alyssa. I feel like that's just the better route. So they miss a turn on the Sorceress, which is fine. We actually take two points away from them. Now I likely take the curse so that they don't go and take the shield off. It feels bad. In this matchup, though, it might actually just be putting curse back in deck with Alyssa instead of the waylays. So if I, if I have to pull a card here, Ser Quan would hit for five. And if we hit the knight 50-50 it, then we can actually just shut down that engine and the grace ability that it had. I think that's what they're going more towards. 19 to five. I was thinking that's going to be a temple pass for me, but... Okay, the hand's good to bleed in with. I have to get out scenario and a lot of that stuff, otherwise we just can't win a long round three. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. This matchup likes to go really tall, so double curse and a heat wave. <laughs> Long live All right, 
take care of that. We have the ability to just use Offering next turn unless they boost that. Okay, yeah, it's looking like an Offering. This will never surrender. It's very difficult to actually not lose card in a matchup like this. In fact, because Simlas isn't playing for four Waylay, it's likely is better to take it now. Take up the backup plans, because that'll be essentially our best way of getting card back. Pop the shield off that so we don't have to worry about it, and then just sink some damage in there. I was kind of hoping more for like a point swing than I was random damage. Like, it didn't really play for a lot of points uh, off the... off either of them. But that makes for a good curse. It's just that if I use leader here, it doesn't work properly because I have one ping that I used earlier. So it comes down to believing that we'll get both cards out of this. I think we will. Long live the king. Yeah. And then they actually have to spend leader. Okay. That was a good trade. So now we get the carryover from the leader into round three, plus whatever we pull. It's almost like having card advantage. It's just not very good when we draw cards like this. I mean, the way lay is actually not bad. So Peller actually saves the day. If I had to spend all my effort getting through that defender, it's a definite loss. Normally, I don't even see Defender on this list, so I was surprised. Really comes down to what the last play is here. Okay, Lady of Lake. So Nero. So match. Okay, so they put match charge on her so that we can't get through her with the leader. Gotcha. Not expecting it's a waylay. And so that just does it. It's close though. 